hi viewers and anyone else who's joining us today on our virtual service for the week. I would just point you towards our website hcckw.ca for the best ways to stay updated and connected during this socially distant time, but for now, here are a few highlights. Firstly, games night. Do you miss hanging out with your friends during this time? Because I know I do. On March 12th at 7 p.m., we are having a virtual games night and you are welcome to join us. There will be a variety of games to play, including Settlers, Jackbox, Among Us, and others. If you haven't heard of these, they're very easy to learn. They're all free. If you have any questions or game suggestions, you can reach out to Eric Munnings at ericmunnings at gmail.com. One of the best ways that we can connect with each other during this time is through prayer. And this week, our prayer focus is as follows that we would pray along with the Apostle Paul to live crucified with Christ. That we would no longer live, but that Christ lives in us. The life we now live in the body, we live by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. If you've been joining us these past few weeks, you'll know that our teaching between now and Easter are on the final words of Jesus from the cross. We look forward now to what Mark Bramer will bring to us as we look at Jesus' word of relationship. Welcome to week three of our seven-week series on the final words spoken by Jesus from the cross. From the very beginning of time, our triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit have been in a relationship Relationships are important. From the beginning of man, God saw that we were alone and created another so that we too could have a relationship. For us, relationship with God and relationship with others are essential to our lives. Some of us, me included, are finding this rest the restrictions of this pandemic hard or sad or at least uncomfortable because we're missing each other. I'm not aware of a time in my short 61 years, say, what? You don't look 61, Mark. Well, thank you, thank you very much. <clears throat> I'm not aware of a time in all my years that I have ever not physically been at church for such a long period of time. Like some of you, my mother brought me to church shortly after birth. And it was just been, and it has just become a rhythm in my life since then. I love church. I love seeing you folks and finding out what has been happening in your life. I love the corporate worship and all that goes with that. And I love breaking bread together. These are the special relationships that we have with one another. Right now, I miss that. Maybe you're the same. Even if you are by nature an introvert and enjoy the quiet times, I still think that there is an energy, a life-giving breath that we get from one another when we meet corporately to worship the God we love. This third word from the cross that we are looking at today as we move through Lent and into Easter is a word about relationships. What Jesus has to say from the cross to those around him and to us is encouraging. The cross would appear to be an ending. It was meant to end, but Jesus turns it into a beginning. When life throws at you what appears to be an ending, Jesus has the power to turn it into a beginning. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 19. And just let me set the scene for you before we read our verses this morning. The scene is this. It's that first Good Friday, a dark and discouraging time for the followers of Jesus. Judas has sold him out. Peter has denied him. And most of the disciples have run away. Their leader, their hope of the future is hanging on a cross. And he's suffering. He has been beaten. He has been humiliated with nakedness and spit. 
he is in pain having been nailed to that rugged beam and his body is in agony just trying to take his next breath. His mind flashes between two worlds. And we pick it up in John chapter 19, verse 25. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother and his mother's sister, the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there, the disciple whom he loved and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. The words are short and to the point. It's what you might expect given the conditions. When words are hard to utter at the end of one's life, you don't want to waste them. Were these wasted words? Or what did they mean? This is the third word or phrase that Jesus utters from the cross. Last week, we heard Eric share about the word of salvation. What a great promise and something we can still claim today. The first week, we heard from Ruth Ann about the word of forgiveness. How we need that more than ever today. Jesus had the power on the cross and still holds the power because of his resurrection that he can forgive. You and I may struggle to forgive, but Jesus doesn't. He forgave those who put him on the cross, and he'll forgive you and me for the dishonor we bring to him. We need forgiveness, and Jesus offers it to us. This third word is a word of relationship. I hope it's encouraging for you. I hope you can see why Jesus, having limited time and energy, spoke these words to those around him and also for our benefit. I think this word from the cross is twofold in its meaning. There is the important practical or human element happening in the physical world, which we can see and which we read about. But I also think there is a spiritual or maybe more mystical realm that is addressed in this word about relationships. You see, Jesus was both man and God, human and divine. Some of us relate more to the human Jesus, while others of us relate maybe more to the divine Jesus. And that's okay, as long as we remember that they are the same person. And Jesus is always fully human and fully divine. When Lori and I got married last year, we needed to look at our last will and testaments. We don't obsess over these things, but there are times in our life when they demand our attention. Many of us have wills since it's a good way to be clear on what you want done in the event of your death. Some have never made a will, which is fine for them because they'll be gone. But it is your loved ones that are left guessing about what your desires were. I now have been an executor of a will on three occasions. And I so appreciate when the deceased has spelt out clearly what their last will and testament is. What I didn't know was that wills have only been in existence since 1837. Prior to that, it was more verbal, a higher level of trust required. And if lucky, there were witnesses. The third word from the cross was really kind of like the last will and testament. In the presence of witnesses, Jesus lays out his desires for what should take place when he is God. You may see both the human and the divine Jesus at work here as we look further into the scripture. In John chapter 19, 25, I'll read again. It says this, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, the Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. There appear to be four women standing at the cross of Jesus. Ironically, three of them are named Mary. I always find it kind of fun and entertaining to read a list on the internet of the most popular baby names of a certain era or a certain year. 
I guess Mary would have made that list back in the first century. And just to muck us up, those of us of simple mind, there are three Marys out of the four ladies here. And Jesus' mother was Mary, as we know from the Christmas story. And then there was Mary, wife of Clopas, which may have been the second person walking on the road to Emmaus with Jesus after the resurrection. And the third Mary you've heard of again, Mary of Magdalene, whom Jesus had cast out seven demons and whom seemed to have been deeply devoted to him as a result, and would also be the first one to see him in resurrected form. The final woman was Jesus' aunt, Mary's sister, which was probably Aunt Salome, mother of James and John, a couple of the disciples. Of the four devoted women there by the cross, Jesus focuses on, mother, on his mother, Mary. We know from other scriptures that she felt things deeply, deeply. She had pondered and experienced the extraordinary circumstances of Jesus' virgin birth. She had been with him all his life, and even at the beginning of his ministry at the wedding in Canaan, where it appears that she was the one who sensed it was time for his ministry to begin. Standing at the foot of her son on the cross, would have broken her heart, and yet there she was, as most mothers would have been for their child. Back in the day, it was common practice for the husband of a wife, for the husband to provide for his wife, and if something happened to him, then the firstborn male would take on that responsibility. We assumed Joseph, Mary's husband, had passed away a long time ago. And so Jesus was the protector and the provider for Mary. And yet, here he was, hanging on the cross, dying. What would become of her? Standing nearby was the one male who had the courage to show up for this execution. That was John, the beloved disciple. Interestingly, the writer does not use the name John but instead explains the relationship he has to Jesus. John 19, 26 again reads this, when Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciple took her into his own home. Jesus takes care of some unfinished business while on the cross. He honors his mother and wants, to, wants her to know that protection and provision will be hers for the rest of her earthly days. He gives to John, whom he loved and trusted. He gives her to John, whom he loved and trusted. And to John, he says, here is your mother. In other words, treat her with love and respect as you would your own mother. She is your responsibility now. From that time on, we read, John took her into his home. An interesting little piece of knowledge that we are told that John is the only disciple who died of old age and was not put to death. Could it have been God's gracious way of making sure Mary was looked after? We like to think so, but regardless we see demonstrated God's care about earthly relationships. We honor him when we treat others with respect and care. Six out of 10, the majority of the 10 commandments listed near the beginning of time are about how we treat each other. Here at Highview Community Church, we have a little saying, love God and love people. And I like that. People have been created in God's image. When we respect people, regardless of color or status or whatever difference, we respect God. May we as a people of God be not only followers of him, but leaders among this world on how we love and care in our relationships with one another. I think this passage in John has a, 
Second point for us to consider, as important as it was to take place, as important as what has taken place with the human Jesus caring for his mother, it may also imply something further related to the divine Jesus. With Jesus giving his mother to John and vice versa, Jesus actually changed the way things worked in that society. You see, normally he should have given his mother to his brother, and yet he chose John. In doing so, Jesus created a new family. That is what he does with those who trust and follow him. He makes us a family. As a lover of the family and all the benefits and good it brings up in my mind, there has always been a passage in scripture that has made me feel uncomfortable. Near the beginning of the Gospel of Mark, there's a story about a crowd sitting around in Jesus. In Mark chapter 3, I'll read a couple of verses. Mark chapter 3, verse uh, 32, we read this. A crowd was sitting around Jesus and told him, your mother and brother are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers? He said. And he looked at those seated around him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. It appears from this passage and others that Jesus is calling people into a new relationship with him and one another, a new covenant. It's not that he has no room for his own blood family. We're not suggesting that the Christian be so caught up in their fighting for the kingdom that they neglect their earthly families. God desires us to honor our blood families. But what we do see happening is that a new family is being created by the Spirit of Christ where there is no blood relation whatsoever and sometimes no obvious similarity or even affection with one another. It's a new covenant written in the blood of Jesus. When the Christian community is working the way it is supposed to, people are brought together who have absolutely nothing in common or may, ha or may even have different views on many different things. This Christian community comes into being without regard to differences. Personal likes and dislikes have nothing to do with the body of Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3, 28. In giving his mother to his, the disciple, Jesus is causing a new relationship to come into existence. He is setting aside the blood relation for a much wider, more inclusive family. A spiritual family. I had the pleasure... For a time to pick up Nick for church each Sunday morning when he lived down in our part of the city. I would pick him up and do the drive through coffee. Nick loves his coffee and then continue on to church. I should say I enjoy a coffee as well on a Sunday morning. As some of you may know Nick from his singing in the Christmas Let It Be concert or in the fun dramas Colin and him have done from time to time or you may have even heard Nick's story. When Nick told me that his family life was not ideal and that he has often said that we were his family here at Highview. We are his brothers and sisters. There is a love and a care among us that is different as we all are. We are family to one another. I love Nick's take on the church because that's what Jesus was establishing while here on earth a Christian community connected through Christ. But here, on that dark crucifixion day, an apparent disastrous event, Jesus speaks words while hanging on the cross to give us hope, to give us direction of care, and to send us to an unknown future, not alone, but with others whom he loves. In John chapter 17, the chapter just before Jesus begins his march to the cross, we read these words that he prays to his Father in heaven. 
They are powerful in light of what we know follows here on the cross. He is in love with us. He desires to have a relationship with us and us to one another. Let me read you one verse out of John chapter 17, verse 11. We read this. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. Jesus' death on the cross was significant in so many ways. It was both human and divine. Jesus died on the cross for me. He died on the cross for you so that our relationship with him and with each other may be one. I hope that in whatever circumstance you find yourself today, that you will be encouraged by the fact that Jesus loves and cares for you. Hope to see you next week for the fourth word from the cross. Blessings. Thank you.